once I started doing that, it has made this monstrous difference in my productivity because guess what? Now I'm more relaxed all evening long and I can be better prepared for the next day. We think that rest is something that is for the weak, but it's really for the strong because it gives our bodies a chance to incorporate all this stuff. And that includes our brains. Mm. I mean, we're learning all day long, but our brain can't incorporate that and build those new pathways until we rest. Welcome back to the Topcast, teachers. It's great to be with you here for another week of fun and games on our show and a very special guest who I'll introduce to you shortly. And we're going to unpack with her just a whole lot of cool stuff about music teaching. You're going to get inspired, you're going to have a laugh, and you're going to fall in love with my guest today. She's an absolute rock star. Now, I wanted to make sure that you heard last week about our five-day challenge that is coming up towards the end of February. It's called Hesitant to Hero. Hook your students with our top three no-book teaching techniques. If you've ever felt a little bit icky, a little bit awkward, a little bit uncomfortable about sitting down with a student at the piano for a lesson or part of a lesson with nothing in front of you but some cool ideas, then this is the challenge for you to take. We're going to be meeting for five days. And every day you're going to get actionable homework each night to keep you accountable and to keep you progressing. It's just a little task, won't take too long, but it's going to mean that by the end of the five days, you're going to totally have amped your coolness factor, like to the max. You're going to be able to help students build better connections between the core concepts and skills they're learning in their repertoire and the music they're listening to today and the composition and improvising that they're going to be able to do. They're going to be more motivated and they're going to be more confident to just sit down and be able to play something at the piano. How cool will that be? Make sure you come and join us. Find out more at topmusic.co slash challenge. And I can't wait to see everybody there at the end of February. Today's guest is an experienced K-8 music educator. Elisa Jansen-Jones specializes in helping music educators build, manage, and grow thriving school music programs and have long and happy careers. She holds a Bachelor of Music, a Master of Business Administration, and is currently pursuing a Doctorate of Education in Instructional Design. Elisa uses her vast and diverse skill set to help nonprofits, businesses, and music educators around the world. She serves as conductor of her local community band, a columnist for SBO magazine, and maintains a private lesson studio. She's an internationally recognized speaker and has presented at national, state, and local conferences. She's a host and producer of the Music Ed Mentor Podcast, founder of the Society for Online Music Education, and author of The Music Educator's Guide to Thrive and The Music Booster Manual. I can't believe how much she's done. Let's find out how she does it all and who she is. Welcome to the show, Elisa. It's so good to meet you finally. Likewise, Tim. I'm happy to be here. Now, you describe yourself in uh, more way. You're not just a music teacher. You're, uh, according to your website and you're probably your business cards, you're a founder, director, educator, instructional designer, podcaster, author, and finally, you're a badass or a badass, as you might say in America. <laughs> so, now, I'm going to get dig more deeply into all these roles, right? But why badass? <laughs> this, this comes up a lot on your sides. You've got a whole page devoted to bit badassery. I, I just totally love it, but tell us about it. You know, the last time somebody asked me that, I said, well, what's important to you? So what's important to you, Tim? What's important to me? Uh, Family? Health? Oh, okay. So if you're really into health, then you might think that I'm a badass because I wake up every morning and I do Wim Hof breathing and yoga and meditation in front of a fire. Um, I journal frequently. I actually get life coaching. Um, I quit drinking some time ago. Um, I tend to eat only whole foods and I get outside every single day. So does that count as badassery for somebody who's into (laughs) healthful lifestyle? Yeah, that's pretty impressive. So is it, is it bad artistry being that you tend with whatever you do and what you set your mind to and the work that you're doing that you tend to go all in and full on? Would that be a fair statement? Yeah, 90, 90 to 111%. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think, you know, I recently realized that I'm I'm really quite comfortable in the flow state, which is just beyond my comfort level. Right. So almost like my theme is I'm comfortable with being uncomfortable. And so part of it is personal challenges like riding 103 miles straight on my mountain bike overnight on the solstice. 
right? Or shaving my head for um, St. Baldrick's Childhood Cancer Research Funding. But it, it is nice to just collect experiences and challenge myself and hopefully do some good along the way too. Mm. Well, there are probably some people listening who are going, who on earth is Tim interviewing? <laughs> I think we need to find out a bit more about you. So tell us about you. What, what are you doing day to day at the moment? Wow. I succumbed to the corporate lifestyle <laughs> um, a few a few months ago, about five months. So I currently work for the Conselmer Corporation, which is a actually owned by Steinway. Steinway is the parent company. And they are, you've probably heard of Steinway, right? Yes, definitely. Okay, okay. <laughs> All my listeners will be familiar with that. Yes, that's what I thought. And and I thought when I saw Con Selma, before I looked it up, I was like, it sound it sounded like something to do with brass to me. Like do they make brass instruments or something? Yeah. Yeah. yeah wind instruments, wind string and wind instruments, band and orchestra instruments. In which case you might be like, well, why would they hire this online, dare I say, badass to to work for them? Um, but they really see a huge value in professional development and professional learning for music teachers. And that's always been my mission. And so since my mission aligned and they they saw a value in, in uh, bringing me on, took them a few weeks to talk me into it, but now I absolutely love it. I get to work with amazing people from all over the world. I get to serve in a variety of capacities that I'm not sure I could have attained on my own in my own entrepreneurial way. And yet I get to be able to stretch myself and my own skills while doing a lot of good in the music education community. But I'm now powered by the big Con Selmer Corporation and Steinway. Mm, there you go. So take us back. Let's find out a bit more about your story uh, that created this very entrepreneurial, passionate, multi-skilled person that you are today. Looking back, when did you start your music learning and what instrument did you start with? Oh, that's a good question. Okay. so. I think part of my desire to achieve is being the fourth of nine children, right? Oh, wow. So I'm the, I'm the middle child who had to do everything I could to excel. Well, wow, that's, a, that's a real middle child. <laughs> that's not middle of three, middle of nine. Wow. But my, my dad was a music educator. My mother was a vocalist. And so I, I grew up in music. I mean, some of my earliest memories were attending band concerts that my dad was conducting at the, the college where he taught. So I was very fortunate to grow up in a very musical home. And I think I started singing when I was about two years old, two or three years old. So of course, you start out as a, as a singer and you end up being pretty musically sound, ideally. And then I picked up a trumpet in about the sixth grade. I was about 10 years old, switched to French horn, continued that all through college, still play that today. And then, of course, I just fell in, fell in love with music. And more than that, even, don't, don't tell anybody I'm saying this. It's our secret, okay? Okay. <laughs> but um, I actually love the teaching even more than just the music. And it's especially been in the last few years when I've taken up guitar and ukulele, especially I'm obsessed with ukulele, mm -hmm. that I've really started to see music as something that's extra internal and very personal to me. And I know that sounds weird to a lifelong musical performer and educator, but you have to internalize it at some point but the, the teaching was the thing for me. So I did French horn and, and vocal. Um, I played in percussion ensemble in high school. I was drum major of my high school marching band. I had full tuition scholarships in college, of course. And then I did something really crazy and got an MBA on top of my music degree. Mm -hmm. And did that start leading you in different directions? Yeah, that was crazy. Okay, so I, I actually left my my full-time teaching job. So I got this awesome teaching job straight out of college, first in my class to be hired. Okay, wait, sorry. Let's go back Go back a step. The college. It's okay. Did you do music at college? Yeah, I did music education. Music, okay. Uh, and mm -hmm. French horn was your instrument of choice? Yes. Yeah, but it was classroom music education. Classroom music education. Yep. But I had to go through all the pedagogy classes for all the Gross. instruments. Yeah. yeah. So I had to pass piano proficiency. I had to take vocal techniques. I took voice lessons, conducting lessons. I actually took almost two full extra years of methods courses so that I could be 
at least grade three on every instrument that they put in my hands. Wow. Did you manage that? Maybe. That's huge. <laughs> I mean, that that's huge. I remember when I, at my last school that I taught at, one of the band directors there, so his primary instrument was trumpet, but he could literally play anything a bit, even to the point where he could lean over a piano or a keyboard from the backside and play it backwards. Like, And I mean, I can't even do that <laughs> He's like brilliant, but it just comes from that exposure to lots and lots of instruments. Well, to get, to get your music education degree, you have to have proficiency on all the instruments and not just be able to play them, but be able to teach them. Mm. And that's why I spent that extra time because I wanted to learn how to teach them. Mm. And the time when I actually learned it best was after my first stint in, in classroom teaching, It was shortly after I had my second child and I thought, you know, I kind of should raise my kids while they're little and I could teach private lessons. So I opened my own private lesson studio and teaching students one-on-one was absolutely the best way for me to develop my own pedagogical skills at that time. Right. And I was in this big college town. We had two colleges, which meant that everybody who could hold an instrument was trying to teach lessons. (laughs) Yeah. So to differentiate myself, I decided to teach lessons to the students who didn't fit the traditional model. So I had homeschool kids. I had kids with developmental disabilities. I had students with physical disabilities, with autism and Asperger's. And then I had sibling sets. And because I could teach everything, it worked, right? Mm. But that was... Anyway, that was my first delve into the whole entrepreneurial world was starting my own private lesson studio. And I interrupted you, I'm afraid. Just after leaving college, you got accepted into, I think you were about to say, or was that the first teaching job you just mentioned? That was the first teaching job. I I opened a brand new school and I had put myself through college working in in a music store. Mm -hmm. So I already had all these great connections. I thought I knew business really well. Okay. I mean, I'd been a manager in a music store. (laughs) And then I opened this brand new school, which meant that I was responsible for all of the purchasing and and budgets and everything like that. And the first time they handed me a financial sheet, I was like, what is this? (laughs) Like, you just, you aren't taught that, you know, just Mm. like when you start your own private lesson studio, you maybe don't know, well, do I need an LLC? What is an S corp? Like, sorry, those are probably US terms, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, you're like, I, I need a, what is this marketing plan and, and P&L statement? You know, you just don't know that because you aren't trained that. You're trained how to, you know, get a kid to sit upright on the piano for longer than 30 minutes. But uh, anyway, so I, I opened this brand new school and that was when I realized that my education had been deficient. And I think from that moment, I really became passionate about um, professional learning. Mm. Okay, so take us through the next steps then that bridge from what that to some of the other big things that you've done, like the conference that you were running. How did that how did you get to there? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a that's a good story. All right. So I opened the private lesson studio, did that for many years. And then I decided I did want to advance my knowledge base. And I definitely wanted more college degrees, if only to get, you know, a little comma after my name and something besides just BM because, you know, Mm -hmm. Bachelor of Music. So I I decided to get a business degree because that's where I had been deficient was Mm -hmm. in the actual business part, not in the pedagogy. I knew the pedagogy inside and out. So I did this crazy thing and, and went and got my MBA. And being the overachiever I am, it was a 24-month program that I banged out in 16 months. Whoa. And during my last class, I was working in this cohort, and we were all talking about what we were going to do with our MBAs after we graduated. And one said, well, I'm going to stay at the company I'm at. I'm just going to get promoted. And one said, yeah, I'm just going to stay where I am, but I'm going to get paid more. And one said, I'm going to go start my own business, right? And then one said, I'm going to be a consultant. And I was like what is this consultant thing that you (laughs) speak of? And he goes, well, I'm going to get people to hire me to teach them business stuff. And I was like, teach? That's, I like teaching. (laughs) And so 
that's when I started my, my second business, I guess at that point. And I started just offering business consulting. And for the first year, I just built my portfolio. So I was just offering whatever to anybody. You want to start a new business? Great. Let's build you a business plan. You have a current business? Let me do a business analysis and give you some help, right? And I ended up building a pretty substantial portfolio. Everybody loves free work, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So after a few years of that, I was like, you know what? As much as I love helping people, I don't, I don't care about these people's businesses. Mm. It didn't feel like it aligned with my personal mission. And so I thought, okay, who do I really want to help, right? Who do I really know? What's the market that I really know? And it was music teachers. Mm. So I thought, okay, music teachers, first of all, being a business person, can you make any money? you know, doing stuff with music teachers, um, which if you look at like Katie Wardrobe or many of our other friends, you know, they probably are doing okay. Mm. And so the, I didn't care about that. I decided I was just going to start helping music teachers. So I, I started doing all the business things, right? I started a blog and I started writing about the things that people weren't taught in college, just like I hadn't been taught in college, but now I knew because I had an MBA. Right. Mm-hmm. So then I start, I built an online course all about grant writing. I built one all about how to develop your lifestyle. Right. And then I started um, my podcast, which I've been doing for three and a half years now. Mm-hmm. That's a music ed mentor podcast, right? Yes. The music ed mentor podcast. Make sure you check it out, everyone. We'll put a link in our show notes. It's amazing. <laughs> it's good fun, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you'll hear me laugh a lot, obviously, and cry some. And uh, yeah, it's it's entertaining, hopefully, and useful. I really hope. Anyway, I hope so. <laughs> so then I started speaking, and this is where it really starts to go crazy, right? So I started getting invited to speak at all these conferences. So these are music teacher association conferences. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. So you were helping private independent music studio teachers more or in classroom teachers? I'm assuming the former. Both. Both. Okay. Because there's so much crossover. Mm. You know, I used to spend every day that I was teaching after school, almost every day I taught students privately. Right. Okay. Yes. Because a lot of them do do both. Mm -hmm. We do both. So as much as I, and remember, I had been a private teacher exclusively for almost a decade. So of course I brought that whole experience in. But then I started um, speaking and I got invited to this big national conference and I was so excited about it. What an honor to be invited to speak at this national conference. I want all my music teacher friends to come and see me speak. Mm -hmm. But none of them were going to because it was in Texas and I live in Colorado and that's a really long ways apart. Right. Right. I think that's about like driving from Scotland to the bottom side of France or something like that. A okay. Really long drive. <laughs> long way. <laughs> yep. That's a long way. Um, so they were like, well, we're never gonna come. And I said, Well, how often do you go get extra learning? Right? Professional learning to help you be better at your career, at your job. And they were like, uh, oh, maybe once every three years, because it's a financial and time burden. And mm. so I was like, you know, I've been running webinars. And I know all these amazing people because of my podcast, because they were my guests. And I thought, why don't I just create this online conference? Because then, and I know this sounds so silly saying this when now everybody's yeah. been online for like eight <laughs> months. You're like, duh, it seems like a no-brainer. But back in 2017, this was unheard of, mm. right? So I created this online conference. And we've had sessions for private teachers for um, people who wanted to start their own like artist sort of business and sell themselves and their skills and classroom music educators, of course. So if you were a classroom teacher wanting to be more of an artist, there was something for you. If you were an artist who wanted to take on more private students, there was something for you. And the first year I was like, we're just going to test out this concept. And it actually ended up being really successful. Because again, nobody was doing it. Mm. And now you could learn music tech skills from Katie Wardrobe, who lives in Australia, who normally would have had to fly to the US for you to hear her. 
Mm. Right. So it just opened up this, this whole thing. And I called it the international music education summit because it truly was international and it was music education. And we all came together at the top of this, this growing climb. So that was the first year. And then every year it kind of grew and grew and grew until this year, of course, when all of a sudden everybody Everything was online. Yeah. Was online. So you did, you did the 2020 conference, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In what month? June. June. Okay. So mid kind of pandemic fun. But you've said, I've, I've seen on the website that you've said um, something like, uh, in fact, I've got the quote here. You've decided to not only replicate what can be done, but to enhance what should be done and to do it on a much larger scale. Kind of very like mysterious language here. So, what's the plan for the International Music Education Summit in the future or whatever it turns into? So now what I've done is because I was the only one three years ahead of everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. So then all these organizations started reaching out to me and saying, can you run our online conference? Like we can't do it in person. Can we do it online? And can you help us? Mm -hmm. So now instead of, because remember my mission is professional learning, right? I want to teach music educators how to build, manage, and grow thriving school music programs and have long and happy careers. So how do I fulfill that mission? I expand. And so now I've hosted, I think I'm at like 10 conferences. So instead of one a year, I've now done 10 times as much. I've hosted more than a thousand professional learning webinars. And what's really, really cool is that because I have this business acumen is I'm transforming the way that we do it. Okay. So just as, as everything evolves over time, because I'm ahead of the curve, you'll see the things that I produce evolving as well. Okay. Was that an enigma? Was that like, no, you, you did clear up some of the enigma. What are, what are some of the things that you've started to innovate into? Like what, what would teachers see that is different about the online workshops that you're running? Or conferences versus what they might expect? Sure. Well, even in in-person conferences, you're usually just sitting there listening. It's a lecture style, mm. right? And sometimes it's participatory and those are the really fun ones that you go to, right? But now we can do the educational lecture, but then transition that into an online course that's entirely self-paced. So now you can do all of this follow-up. Mm. And instead of just doing this lecture, we create a whole opportunity for networking and connecting and mentorship on top of that. And we do things that are extremely participatory. So I held one webinar that was just, I called it a work session. Like this is not a lecture. We're all coming here to work. And I was directing it with my friend, Jessica Peresta, who's another fabulous private teacher, has a podcast, very entrepreneur. And we just sat down and we worked people through these topics and then we set it up so that they could share information. So everybody came out of that, not with Elisa on the podium telling them what to do, but they walked away with all of these ideas and lesson plans that had been generated through this crowdsourcing opportunity. Love it. Yeah, very, very cool. What do you think then are some of the, the big challenges facing particularly independent music teachers today? People are tired of being on screen. Mm. Am I allowed to say that? It's true. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I've got three kids of my own who are forced to, you know, be on screen for camera. Thankfully, that's a new new rule. They don't have to be on camera. But of course, teachers seem to prefer that, even if the students are more participatory without it. But how do you, you know, encourage people when there's so much burnout to mm. being online and to being on the screen. I think that as much as we've seen this massive expansion in the online space, we're going to see as soon as the vaccine happens, as soon as we're able to go back to quote unquote normal, I don't think it is, but you're going to see this big contraction and people are going to embrace more of the in-person opportunities, which is advantageous, right? Mm. But I think right now, 
where you're dealing with that, that burnout, that lack of motivation, the fact that if a student's going to be staring at a screen, it's probably going to be homework. Like that's one of the number one things I'm hearing from a lot of independent music teachers is that students just have so much being put on their plate right now. Mm. You know, it used to be a novelty to have a private lesson on a, on a screen with your teacher. And now they're in it Not all anymore. the time. Yeah, that's right. And, and the thing is, is that teachers don't know how to moderate the workload that they're giving the students because they don't, they, they aren't there to watch over their shoulder and see. And so what I'm hearing is a lot of students are overwhelmed with their, their necessary classwork. And so they're cutting music out of their mm. lives because mm. there's no time. There's the financial, you know, aspects of everything with all of this financial collapse that, that we're dealing with that how can people afford private lessons now? You know, so I think that those are probably the two main things is the the financial issue. You know, how do you get people to pay for something that could be seen as a luxury? Mm. And then how do you keep students engaged and wanting to do it, even though it's on a screen? Yeah, super challenging. And we're quite lucky, I guess, in Australia now, we've kind of got this eradication thing happening like New Zealand did a while ago and so we're finally able to get back to in person but it's definitely not the case in so many other parts of the world and yeah everyone is zoom exhausted and looking forward to a break and needing a break uh, and, and it's, it's hard to know what the solution actually for that is other than to look forward to a time when we can get off our screens a little bit i mean even if kids were on screens all day for school and then could leave their house and go to a music lesson in person i mean that would be wonderful so yes yeah, it's, it's a tough tough time for everyone hmm. that's actually such a happy thought i like had to soak that in for just a second like yes can we just do all the curricular stuff self-paced and online and then all of the the music and arts and interactive Dark stuff in person and, yeah yeah hmm. be good wouldn't it can see your brain think tick, ticking over already. <laughs> Following on from the kind of burnout, one of the things that you are really well known for is helping teachers with productivity and just being organized and, and being able to live the life that they really want to by getting on top of what they've got to do, I guess. And so I wondered if, if you could share a few tips around productivity that you might have shared at workshops and things like that before that we could discuss. Sure. First of all, the... The last time, not the last time, when, when I was speaking at that national conference. What was the conference, by the way? It was the National Association for Music Education. Oh, yes. Okay. NAFME or whatever it's called. Yep. It was the NAFME conference. And, you know, I was doing my whole speaking thing. It was about battling burnout, actually. And somebody raised their hand and said, how do you get everything done? And I, I usually keep my to-do list. And in a planner, I just use a journal. I write it out myself and I held it up and, and I said, this is my to-do list and it's page after page after page after page, right? And I said, does it look like I get everything done? Is everything on this list crossed off? And I held it up to the person sitting next to me and she goes, no. And I said, I don't get it all done. I don't, but I get the important stuff done. Mm. So I would say one, one thing, I'm probably the most important thing is get the important stuff done and everything that's not important wasn't important. So why are you worrying about it anyway? Right? So, so know your priorities and get the important stuff done. So like I told you, I start every day with that routine, yoga, meditation, breathing, writing. I might do some reading, visualization. It's this whole miracle morning thing anyway. Oh yeah. Okay. And this is all before the kids wake up. Yeah, all all before anybody in the house is up. What time do you get up? Uh, between four thirty and five. Okay. Yeah. So, and I have tea. Okay. Anyway, so that that stuff is really important for me because it sets me up to be able to handle anything that's thrown at me the rest of the day. Okay that pissed off parent or that angry coworker or that person on Facebook who literally today was so angry at me. And I didn't know why because really? people are insane. That's why. Yep. 
They're all anonymous on Facebook groups, aren't they? <laughs> right. Basically. I'm, yeah. I'm going to send you a message. They didn't. Yeah. So anyway, but it sets me up to be able to handle all that because that's important. That's why it's worth waking up first thing in the morning and getting it done. So first of all, know your priorities and understand that you're not going to get everything done. Focus on the important stuff, get those done first. And that's okay, which can be really hard, particularly for perfectionists and really driven people to see unchecked off things on lists. It it can be. I admit that I am highly perfectionist, but... I'm trying to focus on not being what everybody else might see as perfect, but being perfectly me. Mm, And if the perfect version of me doesn't get everything done because I've refocused my priorities, then how is that imperfect? Right? I have no response. (laughs) (laughs) So, so, so that's the first one, know your priorities, get them, get them done and and really relax if, if it does not get done. So And that goes with another one of these, which is be patient because you will get the important stuff done. So a a trap that I get caught in is that I look at my to-do list and I go, it all has to be done right now, Mm. right now, today, this list. And it never happens. And so then I just remind myself, there's time enough. There's time enough. Like that becomes my mantra. There is time enough for me to get all of this done. And did we mention that I'm working on my doctorate right now on top of, oh, working full time, doing my podcast, writing for school band and orchestra and choral director magazines, having three kids, riding my bike every day? No, you did not. You're doing a PhD. (laughs) I'm working on an EDD, a doctorate of education. Wow. Okay. What are you, what's your, what are you looking at? Instructional design. Interesting. Okay. Particularly for online production courses and things. Yeah. Oh, very, yep. very interesting. So, and I have, uh, we'll be using this degree for my own nefarious purposes. Mm, stay tuned. But it does require me to tell myself there is time enough. There is time enough. So be patient with yourself and all of us perfectionists work on being perfectly just who we are. It's good enough. It's, it's good enough. Yeah. You, you get to st- set your own standard of perfection. Oh, and here's a big insight that I had this week, okay? You know that little voice that's saying, I should, I should do that. Mm-hmm. I should get that done. I should send those emails tonight. I literally do have to send like 15 emails tonight. But whose voice is that? Who says that you should do those things? Well, it's you. It's just you. So you get to decide. If you really should do those things and changing the language to, I get to do those things or I am doing that now just completely shifts your attitude about it. Should is such a bad word. Yeah. I really should get to that thing. (laughs) But instead it's, I get to send those 15 emails out tonight. So I don't have to do it tomorrow. (laughs) Nice. Right. Word usage anyway. can be so so important. I remember interviewing Nick Ambrosino. I don't know if you know Nick, author of a couple of books. And one thing that has always stuck with me is his approach to the difference between but, the word but, and and when you're dealing with kids. You played that so well, but what you really need to do is X. And kids don't listen to anything that happened before the but. <laughs> so I change it to an and. You played that so well. And now it's time to do this. And I've, that's always stuck with me. The power of a language shift is, is super important. So I really like that you brought that up. Yeah. And I love that you brought that one up because it's one of my favorites. Mm. Is it, anything that you say before, but you've just nullified. Yeah. Uh, Nick actually put it, that he had a funny little saying, anything that came before the but is, I don't know. He made some allusion to bottoms and it was quite funny. <laughs> I can't remember what it was. <laughs> Stop, I'm all embarrassed now. <laughs> Back to the product, the, the tips. I think we've, we've oh, right, I don't right, know right. how many, how many have we done? Three, two? I don't know. We're throwing them out Anyway, there. keep going. Another. Lightning what, round. What else have you got? <laughs> um, okay, so plan your day the night before. This is such a huge one, if, especially if you find yourself waking up in the night, having anxiety about the next day. If you feel like you aren't being productive enough, if you feel like you're forgetting things. I mean, these are feelings like 
we can relate to, right? So plan your day the night before. So I actually use two methods of my to-do list. Okay. I have my big, long running list, which I usually keep on a legal pad and I keep it on my desk. So as I'm in meetings or calls or whatever, I can just add to it. And then at night I sit down with that and my little journal and I love books. I'm like obsessed with, I'm a total bibliophile. I collect antique books. I'm such a nerd. Not so into the Kindle though, more the physical book. Oh no, no, no digital books. Okay. Heresy. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could turn my camera and show you my bookshelf, but I, I have a pretty good collection. Anyway, so I get like these really nice journals that I love to, to hold and then I sit there and I plan my day out. And so now what does that do? Now I'm, I, it relieves any anxiety I might have in the night because I've already gone through and made a plan for what I get to do the <laughs> yep. next day. Right. And I know exactly what time I'm waking up and what my morning routine is going to be and which appointments that I have. So I'm not worried about what I'm going to forget. And I'm not waking up in the night all anxious because I already have a plan for it. So now I sleep well and I'm way more productive the next day. So that's the method that I use. But uh, people swear by this plan your day the night before Mm. and you're going to be more successful all around. Yeah, I've heard that one a number of times. I've never really, I've never tried hard enough to implement it. Mm. And I would, yeah, I should. You're probably the third person. The third time you hear something is the one you should try and when you should do it, right? That's so <laughs> true. I am a total believer in that. Yeah. Three, three times I heard about the seven-day bike trip. And the third time I emailed them and said, I'll do business Let's... consulting for you if you give me a bike trip. And they did. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but uh, no, you're you're absolutely right. I challenge you, Tim, to mm-hmm. try it for seven days. Okay. I'm up for that. That's doable. Seven straight days and then email me and let me know if it worked for you. Okay. All right. I've got like two more. Okay. Okay. Create a keystone habit. And a keystone habit is the like the one thing that you definitely dedicate yourself to do every day. And it has to be something that's really healthy because it will help all of those other helpful habits happen. So for example, if you set the keystone habit of doing yoga every morning, right? Or going to the gym every morning or whatever, it has to be something fun that you love or you won't get up at 5 a.m. to do it. Mm. So you develop, you just focus on like this one super healthy thing. Okay. And once that's a habit, all the other things start to fall in line. So if you're exercising at the gym in the morning, you're a lot less likely to eat junk food during the day because you're like, oh, I just have to work it off, Mm. right? And if you work out every morning, that means that you're not going to oversleep. And because you're working out in the morning, you also aren't going to drink late into the night because you're like, I got to hit the gym first thing in the morning. So a keystone habit is something that you, you love to do enough that you will implement the habit with joy, but that it also helps drive other healthy habits. So for me, I re- this is going to come as a total shock. I am a total workaholic sometimes. <laughs> okay, maybe all the time. And shock horror. I know it's because I love my work, but I was having a really hard time shutting it off during the day. Mm. My kids would come home and mom would be staring at her computer and I wasn't making dinner for my family. I wasn't, you know, doing the, the other important things because I was just work, work, work. And so I decided that I was going to make a keystone habit for myself to go either mountain biking or trail running or road biking or something. And normally I would implement that first thing in the morning. Right. But this time I decided it's going to be at four o'clock in the afternoon. That is when I shut down all of my work and my work brain. It's not just enough to close your laptop or turn off your computer. You have to check out and I'm going to go biking that time every day. I'm going to fix myself a little fancy drink of sparkling water Mm -hmm. and then I'm going to go for a bike ride. And once I started doing that, it has made this monstrous difference in my productivity because guess what? Now I'm more relaxed all evening long and I can be better prepared for the next day. We think that rest is something that is for the weak, but it's really for the strong because it gives our bodies a chance to incorporate all this stuff. And that includes our brains. Mm. I mean, we're learning all day long, but our brain can't incorporate that and build those new pathways until we rest. So create a keystone habit, something that you love, and even though you feel like, well, oh, this is time away from my studio, or I, sh- I could have filled that 
four o'clock spot with two students, right? But it's more important for you to build that healthy habit. And that kind of goes to my last tip, which is truly take care of yourself. Take care of yourself before anybody else, right? Put your mask on first. And if (laughs) you need that three o'clock anxiety nap, do it. Everything else will happen. Rest is productivity and caring for yourself, your body, your mind, your spirit, your life. That is what's going to make everything else fall into place is to love yourself and take care of yourself first. Wow. I think I'd like to bottle all of your ideas and just and just drink it. It's brilliant. It's just so good to hear, Elisa. It's fantastic. Um, thank you for sharing those. And I, I, I'd love for to let people know where they can find out more about what you're up to at the moment. So what I, I know you've got and where they can see pictures of your trail running and your riding and because your your hubby's a photographer and you've got a blog together. So okay, so yeah. Selfless promotion. Go for it. We we do have good pictures. Um they are epic. You need you need to have a like a drone flying behind you on some of those. You need to do some more video stuff and turn into like an X X um X Games thing. My husband just started making these little 3D pictures, oh, which yeah. is pretty cool. And then I've started playing with Instagram reels. Oh yeah, me so, too. Yeah. Right? Super oh, fun. they're so fun. So I'm I'm doing all these outdoor reels now on on a lot of my I mean the adventures where I can actually spend time doing that. Usually I'm getting out between meetings these days, mm. but I am getting out every day because guess what? It's my keystone habit. <laughs> Are you in Colorado? Is that what you said? Yep. So you've got trails galore around you. I am very fortunate that I do. I rode my mountain bike this afternoon between meetings and I rode from home. And I got in about 45 minutes of writing before making it home for the next meeting. So good. All right. So um, Instagram profile, what is it? All right. Um, I'm on Instagram. What is it? Elisa underscore Jansen underscore Jones or something. Okay. In fact, it's all linked from your website anyway, isn't it? True. I have that. That's been the (laughs) nicest thing that I've done for myself is create a one-stop shop for all of my stuff. That's where all the uh, all the titles came from your menu system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Click, click on the badass menu. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's inspiring too. No, it is. It's great. Yeah. So it's just elisajansen.com. But there's links to the Music Ed Mentor podcast. Of course, I have a website, musicedmentor.com. You can connect with me on Facebook, of course. It's at Elisa C. Jones. And I think I'm mainly just social media wise, Facebook and Instagram, but Instagram, as you pointed out so generously is like 90% outdoor trailsy kind of pictures. Yeah, it's very good. All right. Last question. And it's a big one, but hopefully you can share with me. What's the big picture for you? What, where are you heading with all this? Cause you've kind of, you've gone back to the corporate thing, but you're still doing lots of stuff on the side. Where are you going? Where, where's the next, like, what's happening in five years? You really want me to reveal my nefarious purposes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no one's well, listening. It's okay. It's just okay, you and me. Okay. All right. I'm going to imagine you're all in Australia anyway. <laughs> yeah. I really think that we need to revamp teacher training and teach them the business skills so that when they graduate, With a degree in piano pedagogy, they also have a pseudo minor in business management. So revamping how we're taught, taking out the stuff that we don't need anymore because it's not relevant and building a teacher training program at the university level that is relevant and accessible. I'll let you decide what that that means. I love it. Well, and it aligns beautifully with all the work that I've done over the last 10 years with teachers is all aligned by two streams, pedagogy and business, Woo-hoo! because it's so lacking. It's, it's just, it's crucial. Uh, and if we want more music teachers and if we want more music students to keep playing music, then we need to support the music teachers to not just teach well, but to run a good business. So I'm, I'm all with you. We're very well aligned. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> it's been super cool hanging out with you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed today's interview. I had a heap of fun recording it. And next week, we've got another interview, this time with a very long-time friend. Yes, it's the one and only Christopher Norton joining us to talk about what he's been up to during the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 and his goals and his uh, compositions that are coming out in the coming months. I know many of you will teach and love Chris's compositions, as have I, both as a student and as a teacher. So it's always great to catch up with him and seeing all and hearing about all the great things he's doing. So join us next week to find out more about Chris and all the things he's been up to. Until then, I'm Tim Topham and you've been listening to the Topcast from topmusic.co. I'll speak to you soon. For more information about this episode and to find out how to enhance your own teaching, visit topmusic.co. You'll find everything you need for your studio from lesson plans to cheat sheets, quick win teaching ideas and guides on how to build your teaching business. Plus, you'll be connected to a global community of the world's top music teachers. And when you're ready, join hundreds of other teachers around the world by becoming a Top Music Pro member and get access to all our bonus content and flagship courses. And don't forget to follow topmusic.co on social media and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. That's all for today. We'll see you in the studio.